Well, it's difficult, isn't it, to know exactly where some of these sort of abstracted images come from. Certainly in a number of them, I've sort of, uh, there have been uh, ideas I've started from, which have a, a very clear basis in the sort of external world. Um, they just become elaborated, abstracted, if you like, into the uh, image that then develops. And it may not necessarily be recognizable as the uh, object that it started from, but that's what initiated the process. But I think all visual art is a metaphor. It's standing for something that may be very easily recognizable in terms of uh, a representational image that is then made. But even a representational image is itself a metaphor, you are you know, generating uh, a two-dimensional image to stand for a three-dimensional object. So abstraction is really just uh, an extension of that. In part I'm restricted because the kind of printmaking technique I'm using largely restricts you to uh, a relatively small number of colours for each plate you have to think about the sort of combinations that the summation of the plates will produce because you're printing one plate on top of another, diluting the colors down so that they're relatively transparent so that each one shines through but is summated with the colors of the added plates. And sometimes I tend to use colors uh, in the same sort of uh, harmonic tonal range, but at other times more contrasted colours, largely through a process of experimentation. All these different components of the process have their own sort of momentum that just keeps the ball rolling. And I think the fact that the work that I've been doing is abstract is again in part a response to that sort of dynamic process I described in terms of how the image is developing and my ongoing response to that. You do have to anticipate uh, and plan well in advance because you've got to try and, as I say, anticipate how the uh, image is going to develop. Um, that's not to say it necessarily does develop in the way that you plan and actually integrating some of the accidents, if you like, that crop up is one of the uh, interesting and exciting aspects of it. So it, it becomes more abstracted as the uh, process goes on. But I don't want to sound too sort of portentous about it. It's, uh, it's fun. <laughs> Although it's a technology that's very ancient and compared to modern printmaking techniques, incredibly inefficient. It nonetheless generates images that are unique. <laughs> Sorry? Yeah, that was really great. <laughs> yeah, fabulous. <laughs> So, um, all, all credit to my son who, uh, who <laughs> did, uh, in a fleeting visit to London uh, at Christmas time. Yeah, yeah I, think, I think it works yeah. really well. It's it's great. It's very nice. Very nice. Yeah. You missed a bit of um, uh, wiping the plate though. You needed a bit of uh, skin wiping the plate or whatever. That was a mistake. That could always be added. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it was like magic. <laughs> 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 yeah, good. Okay, so shall we uh, kind of get started? Yeah. Um, so I'm just going to ask a few questions and then anybody can kind of uh, come in and if they have something to say, something to add uh, and so on. 
Okay, so just to start us off, uh, James, can you talk a little bit about uh, about your background? Because uh, you have a different background from many of us, and how you came to become a, a, a printmaker, artist printmaker, if you like. Certainly. Um, yes, for those of the, you that don't know me, um, I'm actually a relative newcomer to uh, printmaking, okay. although I've done a, a good deal of uh, art in various forms over the years but uh, um, I've been a doctor in various guises for most of my uh, working life um, and uh, for the bulk of it uh, working as a psychiatrist um, uh, what's called a forensic psychiatrist which is a criminal psychiatrist uh, which is very interesting as you can imagine going into Broadmoor and prisons and uh, uh, appearing at the Old Bailey and all that sort of thing. Um, and, uh, but more latterly, I ended up looking after doctors who had uh, drug and alcohol and mental health problems, um, but retired completely from that about uh, two years ago. And uh, I've spent my time since then uh, either printmaking or uh, bicycling. Um, so uh, that's it very briefly, but just a little bit of background, uh, you know, because as a psychiatrist, I can't uh, really escape telling a little bit about uh, my early life. Um, I grew up in Cambridge. Uh, my dad was a, a GP there, um, but part of that sort of rather enlightened generation after the war who were keen to sort of... Um, uh, see a much better and uh, healthier society. So he was a very keen advocate of uh, the uh, NHS when it was uh, instituted in uh, 1948, I think. Um, and um, uh, at the same time, he was a very keen painter. I mean, very keen. He uh, did a lot. Um, he had so he told me, he said to his father that he wanted to be a painter, but uh, his father said to him, don't be so ridiculous, uh, you're going to be a doctor. So he was a doctor. So you can see that uh, all the uh, uh, influences uh, that uh, shaped uh, my subsequent career were pretty uh, uh, well established. But he was great fun, my dad, and uh, uh, I was one of uh, five kids and... Uh, it was, uh, it was a fun household, but there was a lot of uh, uh, painting and art about. Um, and we had a bit of an art library in our loo upstairs. So I was exposed uh, very early to uh, Penguin Modern Painters. And I particularly remember um, uh, de Kooning and um, uh, Brack, um, Ben Nicholson uh, and Patrick Heron. So uh, uh, they were sort of... Uh, uh, very formative uh, an influence um, and at school I sort of wrestled with uh, ideas as to uh, you know what on earth am I going to do in uh, in life and uh, um, as all of us do I suppose but uh, uh, in the end I decided to do medicine which I did and uh, uh, initially I worked as uh, a more conventional hospital doctor which was itself very interesting. And I did that for about 10 years and uh, uh, latterly worked in the Caribbean for a year and then came back to uh, this country and retrained in psychiatry. And as I say, I then, um, I then did uh, forensic psychiatry uh, for most of the, the rest of my uh, career. And you may think, well, what on earth has this got to do with uh, uh, art or, uh, anything else. Um, well, I think actually it's very interesting, the sort of overlap between uh, uh, psychiatry, particularly amongst uh, specialities within medicine and uh, the humanities generally, because uh, um, I suppose literature particularly has always um, had very strong associations with uh, uh, psychology and psychiatry. I mean, if you think about it, uh, Shakespeare was exploring very complex uh, psychological themes long before psychiatrists were ever invented. If, if one looks at sort of Macbeth and Hamlet and 
so on. Um, so there's a lot of overlap. Um, and so within medicine, there are a lot of people who, uh, uh, who have interests of one sort or another uh, in uh, various uh, aspects of uh, the humanities. So uh, there is a lot of overlap. And I think the, the other thing that I've always been really interested in is the sort of uh, uh, the psychological and cultural developments of the early 20th century, where there was this extraordinary overlap between science and uh, the arts. So that while on the one hand you had uh, quantum physics being developed, uh, you also had Freud uh, emerging in the sort of first couple of decades of the 20th century. Uh, while at the same time you had Picasso and Brack uh, uh, sort of unpicking the image in the development of Cubism. So it's this very, very interesting uh, uh, gestalt that existed at the time uh, where everything was sort of being uh, unpicked and if you like sort of superficial uh, imagery uh, in everything was being sort of uh, uh, dissected to sort of reveal the sort of underlying principles and structures that uh, lay behind it. So, as I say, I've, I've always been interested in all those sort of uh, components that were uh, uh, influencing each other at that sort of time. Anyway, that's, uh, that's my background in, uh, in brief. Um, all the time I continued to uh, uh, do quite a lot of uh, arts, largely sort of life drawing at Morley College, uh, which I did for I think 17 years on on uh, on uh, the stretch, um, and uh, saw lots of different uh, tutors in that time. And it was very interesting, actually, the difference between uh, the kind of teaching I got in uh, in uh, uh, art classes and the teaching I got in medicine. Um, it was much less, obviously, um, and understandably, much less sort of directive. And I, I, I had this idea that actually the best art teachers were those that sort of just kept your enthusiasm uh, uh, going, a bit like sort of uh, spinning a bicycle wheel, you know, just keep, keep it going. Um, without actually sort of uh, telling you exactly what to do. Um, and it's a very difficult thing to do, I have to say. Um, not that I've tried uh, art teaching, uh, but I've done a good deal of uh, other types of teaching over the years. Um, but about five years ago, I was lucky enough to uh, bump into Adrian Bartlett as, a, as a, an opening night. And we got chatting and he said, well, come along and uh, try some printmaking. Um, so for a couple of years, I went every Monday morning uh, to his house where he very generously taught me to print um, and uh, gave me lunch. Uh, and uh, we became very friendly. And uh, I did that for, as I say, two years. And then... Uh, graduated to uh, Slaughterhouse, where I've been ever since. So there we are. That's the background. That's great. <laughs> okay, um, it's, it's really good to hear that all in one go. Obviously, there's a lot of things that I know, but it's quite nice to hear the condensed version of it all. It's nice. Um, just to move on, um, can you talk a little bit about what are your um, main inspirations now and how they influence your work? You've talked a lot about um, things that have been inspirations for you kind of from early years and then throughout your time you know Morley and printmaking and so on. Yeah well um, I was lucky enough in the middle of my uh, medical studies to do a year of uh, history of art uh, which was which was terrific actually um, it was a very enlightened aspect of the uh, medical course I was doing that uh, uh, encouraged people in their third year to do any subject they like and people did uh, uh, everything from uh, art history to uh, uh, theology and philosophy and things but uh, 
I did uh, the development of, of modernism and, uh, and that uh, embraced a lot of those uh, ideas that I've mentioned. Um, so there were obviously various modernists that I was interested in, but I suppose in terms of uh, sort of earlier influences, I've always loved sort of uh, early Renaissance uh, painting. I think I think the sort of boldness uh, and the simplicity of the uh, the form and the colour um, and the sort of just the directness of the uh, imagery I've always loved. Um, and uh, uh, that was sort of reinforced in my sort of gap year when I went to um, Italy and saw Giotto and so on. But uh, uh, in terms of more modern influences, uh, Picasso inevitably is hugely influential. I mean, I don't think, I really don't think there's anybody who uh, has his sort of uh, uh, visual intellectual uh, complexity and sophistication. Um, you may not like him and you may not uh, uh, like his personality, but I think he is so remarkable in terms of uh, his ability to uh, invent uh, in so many different uh, genre and so many different uh, media. Um, you know, you could, uh, I mean, it's a bit dispiriting because one wonders what the hell one can do in comparison, but uh, he is nonetheless fantastically inspirational. And with him, Brack, who, uh, it's a rather more modest character, but I think uh, uh, is also a wonderful painter. Um, and uh, alongside, of course, both of them, Matisse, uh, for his fantastic line, um, which I don't think uh, anybody uh, in the 20th century bettered, uh, even Picasso. Um, so they were very much uh, influential figures. I mean, I know they're sort of uh, rather um, headliners, uh, but you can't really escape them. But perhaps more modestly, uh, some of the sort of English modernists, I particularly like Roger Hilton. I think his sort of really sort of raw, uh, raw imagery is uh, terrific. Uh, you can you can hear the sort of uh, booze sort of uh, emerging from it. Um, he was a terrible alcoholic, as I'm sure you know. Um, but it's it's very powerful, I think. And Patrick Heron, um, I liked very much. Um, and uh, of course, Howard Hodgkin, who uh, is somebody that. Uh, I'm afraid may be all too obviously an influence uh, on what I've done. Um, because having got into printmaking, um, I, um, I, I came across some of Howard Hodgkin's uh, more, um, not more recent because we're talking 30 years ago, but uh, some of the developments in his printmaking, uh, I just found terribly exhilarating because uh, he seemed to do things with uh, uh, conventional printmaking techniques that uh, nobody else did. I mean, they weren't entirely conventional because he embraced uh, carborundum techniques. So I'd, I'd gone to the, um, the uh, Alan Christie Gallery, which in those days was in Cork Street, and uh, got chatting to one of the... Uh, uh, people on the desk and uh, he was terribly nice and very helpful and he said oh well, come downstairs so uh, it's very exciting when you go into these galleries and you go down into the sort of holy of holies and then they, they start pulling out all these uh, these original prints um, and he pulled out uh, a plate uh, that uh, Hodgkin had used to do one of these uh, uh, carborundum and collagrass and uh, it was so exhilarating to see it and uh, uh, so I just went away and started experimenting with uh, doing uh, just that technique 
Why? Because I like the uh, immediacy of it, the sort of the gestural uh, uh, flamboyance of it. Um, and of course, the other thing that it uh, provides that nothing else does in quite the same way is that sort of uh, added uh, three-dimensional sort of embossed quality so that uh, uh, you've got a sort of three-dimensional component um, in, the, um, in the printing, um, which can be very exciting, I think. And combining those techniques with others like uh, aqua tinting in different plates, I think can generate some really interesting uh, imagery. Um, I hope it's not uh, simply a pale uh, imitation of Howard Hodgkin, but uh, uh, as you know, because you've often been there with me on a Monday uh, uh, over the last couple of years, it has got a bit better and it's certainly got bigger. <laughs> yeah, so, I, uh, I think, um... Yeah, it's been uh, really interesting watching you work over the last years because we have have spent quite a lot of time working quietly next to one another and observing one another doing whatever we're doing. Um, and it's it's been interesting just kind of watching your kind of, um, what do you call it? Not, not patience, but you, you, like you kind of keep on going with it because it's kind of hard, it's hard work. It's kind of hard slog dealing with these plates and kind of you know um trying different color combinations and you know it's it's um it it's a it's a long journey that you that you go on hence you've talked about the journey uh and the, your title of your show but um uh, and i think that's it, that it's just been interesting seeing that um it, could you are there any other things that you talked about the kind of gesturalness and the um uh, kind of feel for the materials. Are there other things that kind of come into it in terms of uh, other influences? Because often when you've titled work, you've used um, kind of more landscapey kind of references. And you've talked earlier about kind of the colours being re related to seasons and things yeah. like that. So are, are there new things that are kind of gradually coming together with it? Yes, I mean, I I am interested in uh, landscape and I particularly interested in landscape. I'm not sure. I mean, I think that uh, inevitably it's uh, it's one of those uh, emotional scenarios where uh, um, it sort of inevitably provokes an, a, a response. Um, so often it's a, a source of um, uh, the sort of images that I uh, develop. Um, and there are, I, one person I didn't mention, but is somebody I've, uh, I've always liked, and again was one of those penguin modern painters, was uh, Ivan Hitchens. And uh, uh, it's, it's, I mean, I think he has some, I'm not sure everybody would agree, but I think there are some sort of uh, correspondences between him and um, and Howard Hodgkin, uh, certainly in the sort of uh, bold gestural quality of uh, their mark making. Um, and uh, it's that, it's that sort of uh, signature, um, that gesture, line, particularly make, that uh, I find very interesting. It is, you know, I mean, it is, it is like handwriting, really, and uh, you can so often identify an individual by the quality of the uh, mark making that uh, they use um, and in ways that I have to say I find very difficult to uh, actually analyze or uh, describe in any kind of detail it does have some sort of psychological um, uh, meaning 
I think one can interpret something about uh, the individual from the uh, particular signature that they have. Um, I don't mean literal, lit, lit, literal signature, I mean uh, the signature of their mark making. Um, and um, as I say, I, I'm not sure I could uh, detail that, but uh, uh, nonetheless, it is, uh, it is something that uh, I find very intriguing. Mm -hmm. So in answer to your question, yes, uh, gesture, uh, line, uh, color choice, uh, material choice, the medium, yeah, all and, those. Um, in terms of uh, color, color is obviously incredibly important and um, your kind of palette of color is also the colors you choose that come together. You know, you've got warm colors and you've got a kind of colder colors and earthy things, earthy kind of colors coming together. So there's quite a specific choice when it comes to a kind of maybe ma you've made the same print but using different colors haven't you in mm. in quite a few times um does that yeah. kind of is that something you just kind of it just happens and you think oh let's I, try it, it it's largely uh, uh the result of uh, experimentation and uh the range that uh, intaglio offers yeah <laughs> 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 but I think one of the things that has been so helpful, uh, and uh, Michelle and uh, Rob have been uh, particularly helpful on this score, is, uh, you know, how important it is to, uh, to use extender. Um, because if you are using multiple plates, you've got to uh, um, allow each plate to have the opportunity to uh, um, be heard. And uh, one of the mistakes I made early on was just uh, uh, plonking one plate on top of the other um, and uh, one colour would then completely obliterate the, uh, the one underneath. But uh, yeah, yeah. if you use lots of extender and uh, yeah. you know, Rob often says you know, up to 80% uh, extender uh, allows the colour really to uh, shine yeah, through. Yeah, yeah. So it's all part of your journey, really, isn't it? Of kind of finding what works and yeah. um, how how to how to move it on. Yeah. Um, okay. Um, we, you've talked a lot about you know what you're doing at the moment. Um, can you talk about how the work has changed over a period of time uh, from when you started? Uh, maybe has it been three years at Slaughterhouse? I think it's about three years. Three years? So how, how has it changed over time and what, what were the kind of causes of that change? Well, since I've been at Slaughterhouse, which uh, in terms of um, my overall history is not actually terribly long, uh, it has okay. changed in that, uh, as I said earlier, it's got, uh, it's got bigger, um, which I like. I like big. I don't know why but uh, I've never been very good at sort of uh, expressing myself modestly. Um, it's also got more confident, it's got, I've learned some of these techniques that I've uh, described so I've, uh, I feel more uh, uh, confident in the process. Um, it has got um, uh, more abstract uh, but it's also as I say, use this sort of combination of different techniques. So uh, using uh, aqua tint in combination with uh, the carborundum. Mm. But I suppose, um, I mean, in terms of my printmaking uh, history, which as I say, goes back five or six years, I have gone from originally doing sort of uh, line drawing, uh, sort of traditional etching, which I have to say I really like, um, but um, I've always been ultimately more attracted to uh, these bigger, more abstract uh, ideas. Mm. Yeah, great. Okay. Um, can you talk a little bit about what comes next? Uh, anything new on the horizon for you? Um, 
And then maybe after that, we can have some questions from um, anybody who wants to ask something. Um, okay. Uh, what comes next? I'm not sure. I mean, I, um, I've, uh, I mean, I had hoped to, uh, as, as you know, to have had an exhibition in uh, April, but uh, that never happened. I, I'm hoping that uh, it will at some point, um, not least yeah. because, uh, all stacked around this room are lots of rather expensively framed uh, prints. I'd like to get rid of them, but yeah, um, yeah. Um, so that's part of it. And I hope that I can perhaps uh, add to what I've uh, I've already done. Uh, so it'll be uh, uh, slightly bigger than uh, originally planned. Um, but I think um, you know. I feel like I'm. I've started on a, I feel confident a bit, well, much more confident about uh, really pursuing uh, this technique, which up, up until a, about a year ago, I felt I was just sort of uh, uh, finding my way. Yeah. It's, but, uh, it's notching up those 10,000 hours that you have to. <laughs> I know. Well, when you get to my age, Claire, you know, you have to uh, count those 10,000 hours rather carefully because you haven't got that many left. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, has anybody got questions? I think any, anybody can um, ask them. I, I'd like to ask you, um, James, slightly prod you into whether they are internal states, to what extent your images are internal states or internal landscapes. Is that important? Is that, is that something you don't wish to engage with that? Because that, that, you talk very technically, it's all quite distanced how you talk about your work. But as a psychologist, uh, I'm always very interested in, is that, is that just a, a very good device you have? to deflect whether they are internal states of mind? Well, I mean, I'd like to give you an answer, but I don't know that I can. Um, and I th it's the sort of, uh, it's, it's that uh, eternal dilemma when you're talking about visual art as to yeah. uh, quite how you can um, uh, determine uh, exactly what it represents. Um, yeah. I mean, I, I hope what I was saying about uh, the, the nature of uh, the signature, uh, that I was suggesting that actually it is about, it is about you, it's about your uh, emotional not necessarily state in the here and now, but it, 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 it is inevitably about your uh, inner world. Um, yeah. Even the most uh, obvious representational uh, art is about yeah. the inner world. Um, but it is so difficult, isn't it, to uh, determine exactly uh, how and uh, exactly um, exactly what but i mean it's so clear whenever you look uh at one person's uh imagery compared to another it's quite clearly very very distinct and nobody uh nobody i mean it's nobody's the same um so i i have to agree that uh uh it is part of one's uh inner world but uh, i'm not quite sure how so I'm sorry to be so feeble in uh, my response. I've got a kind of related question, really. Although from the opposite end, because I should think after a lifetime of um, forensic analysis, <laughs> it must be heaven just to, you know, open up everything. You know, there's, anything is possible. So you're going from this analysis to something that's completely the opposite. Well, I, I'll tell you so, something, Alex, that uh, I found terribly distressing at the time. Um, I was interviewing a man in uh, Belmarsh Prison about uh, 15 years ago who killed a child. Um, and, um, 
you know, despite what uh, the sun might encourage you to believe, uh, there aren't many people who uh, become killers and murderers as a sort of uh, oh, career. Oh, sorry. Oh, no, sorry. We've got that funding. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I'm just going to check it. Sorry, I, that was a very important moment. But I don't check think it properly, it's... check it properly. Don't get too excited. Sorry, I, so, sorry, sorry. Carry on and I'll tell you at the end. <laughs> well, I was just going to say that I, I was talking to this man and uh, there, not many people become uh, murderers as a career choice. Um, <laughs> it's not, you know, they don't become the most popular folk in the community. And... Uh, um, he was uh, he was uh, deeply ashamed of what he'd done, but he was driven by you know hideous sort of internal forces. Um, and one of the things that was terribly striking uh, was he actually told me that he could not actually sit in front of a blank piece of paper because he would, if he had a a pen, he would just. He would stab it. He said he would just destroy it. Um, and um, so obviously for him, that uh, represented the, the paper, if you like, uh, yeah. was a very clear um, uh, metaphor for uh, the body, the flesh, whatever. Um, and I can't quite remember exactly what you were asking me, uh, Alex, but I was very, very struck at the time what, uh, uh, how interesting that uh, association was. Well, yeah, I mean, it, it, it relates because the point is that he couldn't, he couldn't free himself from all, all, all the stuff that was in his head, obviously. He yeah. couldn't let, let, let it go even. Yeah. Yes, you were asking sort of, uh, yeah, I'm saying after, you. after that sort of experience, um, how obviously how nice yeah. it is to free myself from, yeah. Uh, yeah, just from to, uh, that sort of activity. Well, you're absolutely right. I have to say, when I retired from uh, all all that kind of work, I noticed uh, I uh, I used to sleep a lot better. <laughs> mm, I can imagine. Yeah, yeah. Not that I was, uh, you know, necessarily consciously weighed down by uh, some of the distress that I inevitably uh, encountered but uh, I think uh, obviously it uh, affected me um, so it is very nice not to uh, uh, be weighed down by that but um, I have to say that I don't actually find uh, art work uh, particularly relaxing you know people always say well it's so nice to uh, <laughs> Uh, do these things it's uh, it's such a relaxing hobby I've never, <laughs> I've never I've never found it relaxing and uh, uh, one of the reasons I never pursued it as a career when I was at school was because uh, as my um, you know being a highly neurotic individual like uh, well like I am I I I found when the sort of self-critical faculties started kicking in in my adolescence, nothing was ever good enough. So uh, um, I found it really difficult to uh, uh, do any kind of artwork. So it was much easier to do something that was uh, rather more prescriptive. Um, yeah, I can see that. Yeah. And I have to say that as I got older, I just stopped being quite so uh, mean on myself and uh, it became a bit easier. I think that's the answer. Mm. I don't know whether that resonates with other people, but uh, um, I find it a lot easier now than I did uh, 40 years ago. Well, that shut everybody up. <laughs> <laughs> well, I agree with it. Yeah, no, I was just thinking of the idea of taking the, the, the piece of paper uh, and, and you get a very... Um, you have a very intimate relation, don't you, with your paper and your printmaking? And uh, you know, for that man not to not to be able to do that is quite extraordinary. Because you know, the way in which you pick up your paper to do a, uh, you know, to, to to use a sketchbook, or your sketchbooks have a particular, you know, they have to have a particular paper in them for you to be able to feel comfortable with them, or the way you know you choose your papers because of the, you know, it's very much what we're doing, isn't it? That sort of it's like a love affair with that paper, and uh, you know, your description of that. 
Yes, no, I... that isn't it? Uh, we yes. love our paper so much. Yeah. Uh, and sensation. It's really... it's about sensation, isn't yeah. it? The sensory world of the haptic. Mm. Mm. Well, you were talking about that that last time, Sarah, weren't you? Know the, mm. the paper and your egg boxes and and and, yeah. and that allowing think, yourself into that world. Yeah, I think yeah. sensation is very um, strong in printmaking, isn't it? And I mm. think um, that's where the joy is, in a way. Then the, it gets the the other side, which is more the angst of is it any good and what are you doing? It's mm -hmm. that drives you forward because you love the, the uh, exploring the intricacies of why that particular thing is, is, is gives you more pleasure than that. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And the things that are really satisfying, like a very good black or, yeah. or, or a paper or, or, or as you described, you know, the, 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 the heaviness of the carborundum uh, uh, yeah. surface on the paper is, is really, really, well, it's just satisfying, isn't it? It's yes, just... I do agree. I mean, I think that uh, there's there are elements within printmaking that uh, that extend that sort of sensory uh, experience in a way that uh, um, other more traditional uh, image making doesn't. I think it uh, it does have a very important sort of uh, added extra. It's just interesting because yeah, um, some some people here were we when we talked with uh, Sarah Gersley Hoyser at the, in the first uh, talk, and we uh, we had quite an interesting conversation then about how we how we were looking at the work Sarah because of the way you displayed it and everything, and then the film and and um, uh, Sarah Prale's film last week as well, and James, you talked about yours, but you know this idea that I wonder if we're more excited about the paper and the stuff then because we we generally show it to people under glass and all the rest of it don't we and it's a really interesting question isn't it like what if other people get as much as we're getting i'm not sure that they always do and i wonder how we could because that is what's so special about it isn't it there's quite a lot of misunderstanding about it isn't there it's like looks like a flat bit of paper to most people well there's misunderstanding and that some people aren't aware that uh some things are um, made, you know, printed into the paper and some things just sort of are like a skin on top of the paper. Mm -hmm. I think for most of us, it's that sort of, it's that sculptural quality of, of um, squidging into the paper. Mm -hmm. um, it's, there's a sort of intensity about it, which is very satisfying. Mm -hmm. Yes, I do agree. And uh, the other thing is that, uh, that uh, as with absolutely everything uh the more you know about it the more uh, interesting it mm. becomes um and certainly my appreciation of uh, uh printmaking has uh increased enormously since i uh, uh became interested in it and uh i i now find it uh, uh riveting james when you said um when you spoke about the blank piece of paper being stabbed or like his compulsion to stab it my immediate response was that it was the paper represents like all the possibilities in life and that you have to make a decision to make a mark on it and that pressure being too much for him was my immediate response but as obviously as an artist i'm familiar with that kind of blank page problem and i sometimes think of printmaking as quite an elaborate means to get over that because you're so you've done so many processes between like thinking and getting to the blank piece of paper that you don't have to deal with, with those decision making that that kind of blank page in the same way but i was i was also thinking in relation to your prints that there's kind of structures that you seem to come back to that uh, almost like grids and they um go from top to bottom or bottom or right to left and whether you're kind of shying away from analysing those in any way and like what your what your natural tendencies are to like get rid of that problem of the blank page and what they might reveal about you. But I've just said, I've not actually asked you a question. Well, <laughs> it's, it, it's interesting you say that because uh, I've often said almost precisely that, uh, that uh, I, fi I do find the blank page threatening and I do find the uh, uh, relief that comes from printmaking is in part because of all those processes that, uh, mm. uh, as I said, actually 
said in the film, you know, it provides a kind of momentum that uh, keeps you rolling. Um, and uh, once you're rolling, it makes it easier to uh, uh, confront uh, some of those decisions, which are difficult, I think. Mm. But also, I think it allows you to um, to send things in different directions. If you've got the opportunity of producing a beginning several times over, you can take that beginning in lots of different directions. In a way, I never, I mean, I'm too neurotic to paint because you feel, what if I get rid of the bit that I liked last week and I don't like what I've done this week as much? You, don't, you know, whereas with printmaking, you've got that wonderful sense of, of of a starting point and you can always come back to it well unless you're doing a, a suicide print but suicide print what, 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 <laughs> what i mean uh, you know where you where you cut away each time and print oh uh, yeah reduction reduction, yeah. reduction. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but it is interesting what ellie said because uh, you quite often do that square don't you so you're like you're containing the page to you're containing it, aren't you? Quite often. You're, you're giving yourself some known structures to work within, um, some kind of comfort points to to start yourself off with, and yeah. I think also using the those big plate, big square plates. You've got a uh, some those structures as well that you are kind of sticking to, which is great. I think it's great to see this kind of series of things yeah. uh, appearing that are all the same size. But having that, it gives you a, a kind of a comfort to work within that this it's not everything is out of control. There are some very controlled things and it's all OK in a way you can, you know, the, some things can be left to see what happens. But there's other things that are very firmly, you know, dug in there and you can see what happens. Yes, I think it's rather interesting that uh, we've developed this conversation. So we've not only alluded to uh, uh, homicidal killers, we've also had suicide prints and uh, uh, everything in between. So, uh, which I'm sure actually is uh, valid because uh, I think, um, as Sarah suggested, um, you know, it is all about our uh, inner selves. Um, but as I say, I hesitate to know exactly how. Yeah, but I think that's pretty, pretty normal. We're all kind of on this kind of road of discovery of what we're doing and who we are and why we're doing it. So and I don't know if anybody really comes up with a, you know, a glass clear strategy or solution to what it is. You just keep on going and it's kind of, uh, and when you're on a roll, which you, I think you are, you're kind of, you know it's it's happening and you know what you're doing and you're going forward then you're in a, a good place i think well i hope so <laughs> yeah i think so if you had a crystal clear solution then you'd stop yeah no yeah to... you wouldn't make the next one would you otherwise you it propels you forwards because it's always there's always something else you can add but I think also there's something about being at this certain age in one's life exploring one's artistic language because we've got more facility to do that. It's almost like a return to childhood in terms of exploring play and the sensory. And that seems, is very joyful, I think. Uh, and printmaking affords that play of the sensory world. I think it's a, it's, um, it's a lovely space. Yes, no, I agree.